The last um, presentation of the day is, is integrating virtual reality-based medical simulation training into the healthcare enterprise um, with Karthik Sarma from Simex. Hello, hi everyone. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, as Seth mentioned, I'm Karthik from Simex. I am co-founder and CTO here at Simex and also a psychiatrist at UCSF Health. Um, we're here today with a, a panel of uh, folks who I, I've worked with over the last couple of years, um, really looking at how we can bring VR training directly into the healthcare enterprise. A lot of the talks here at WE are from technologists, um, engineers, uh, people who are bringing kind of the te technical future of VR um, into the present day. And so I thought it'd be interesting for us to bring some of our end users, some of the clinicians who use VR for healthcare training every day to talk about both how they've been successful and what the challenges are in the hopes that that could help motivate the future of the field. And so I'm, I'm really, really excited by this panel that we have here today. We have four folks who are really at the forefront of bringing VR into the healthcare enterprise for training in four completely different kind of functional areas around the country. And so I, I think it's gonna be a, a really um, exciting panel and I hope you'll all uh, join me in welcoming them and they'll each uh, have an opportunity to introduce themselves, themselves and a little bit of what they do. So we will start with Anne-Marie. Hi everyone, um, as he said, my name is Annie Hoyt Brennan. I'm the director of the Simulation Center at University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. Uh, we got into virtual reality because we are a city school and we run six days a week. We're super busy from six in the morning till nine at night. So we wanted to be able to ex extend simulation beyond the walls of Fagan Hall. And so um, we started with creating two cases. Um, one of the, the use cases is, you know, Right, as, you, as people in a simulation center, it's very expensive, obviously, to set up these simulations uh, with operations, um, with space, real estate, and obviously the simulators are very costly. And so we started with a, a course that was a critical care fellowship program that runs a lot of complex simulations that are very intensive setups. And so we ran a um, hypotension, uh, I'm sorry, a TAA status post, uh, TAA case that ends up with hypotension and uh, spinal shock. And uh, we ran that through our fellowship program. And then we also created an anesthesia case, uh, emergence from anesthesia. Some of the things that we wanted to focus on are things that are difficult to simulate in person. So neurological deficits was a huge um, bonus for us using virtual reality. So we can you know, be flexible with VR. Uh, we can run it beyond simulation times, wherever we want. Um, we can set up complex cases and run them repetitively um, and objectively through each and every single case. So we've had a great experience and I, I look forward to sharing more about it with you. Thanks so much. Now we've got Beth. Hi, I'm Beth Kalras. Um, I'm at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. We started our journey with uh, virtual reality, uh, looking for ways to help our students have experiences that they may not have in the clinical setting or that we are unable to set up. So we started with a sepsis case, uh, which is something the students may not have the opportunity to see. We also have a mobility case. Um, then we got a grant for primary care, care of a COVID patient. Uh, we've also looked at what is the difference between students who experience simulation and virtual reality versus with a high-fidelity mannequin. And we have found that the learning is, is essentially the same between those two different types of simulations. We're working on getting our uh, VR program across the state of Nebraska. We actually have five campuses of our College of Nursing. So we are able to then also help faculty use their time more efficiently because if I am facilitating a uh, virtual reality simulation, I can have students on all five of the campuses across the state participating at the same time, which saves time and scheduling and faculty um, resources for us to do that. And we're also looking at other ways to have um, simulations similar to the idea of things that may not even be safe in the clinical setting, things like a, a violent patient, um, an aggressive patient, someone who is acting out so the students can feel safe and learn how to take care of those patients as well. So it's, uh, it's good to share this with you all. Thank you for having me. All right. Oh, and this, sorry, I forgot to give you a slide. <laughs> All right, and uh, John. 
Yep. Uh, so John Dorsch, I'm a retired Air Force Colonel. I retired last summer after 25 years of being in the service and had the opportunity to train um, uh, learners of all levels, whether it be a medic, I've worked with nurses, worked with physicians. I still um, i am an emergency physician by training. I did aerospace medicine as well in the Air Force, but I'm a full-time clinician and uh, train uh, residents in emergency medicine. So I've found that this VR is very, very flexible, especially for those who don't get enough clinical contacts, kind of as sustainment. So um, f about five years ago, I think to the day, I'd reached out, did some online looking while I was in uniform, saying, hey, we need to train differently. We don't have a lot of time. We don't have access always to the level of acuity that we need in terms of patients. So how do we deliver this better? So in, in the military, we have a lot of medics that are highly trained, but then they, they really, their skills kind of languish over time because they just don't have access to high quality training. And in particular, the pararescue men who are what we call PJs, they're combat rescue specialists who have to do a lot of things other than medicine, but sometimes they're the ones that can get to the patients. And so I finished up as the Air Force's medical director for pararescue. And so had about 700 of those across the total force and tried to find ways of distributed learning and how to deliver content to them as it fits in their busy schedule. And so ultimately I reached out, I, I found Simex online and just said, hey, we need to start building military use cases. And we were very effective at getting uh, Air Force grant money through uh, what's called the Small Business Innovation and Research um, Project. It's a federal, uh, federal program, um, but the money gets dispersed down to the DOD and to the services. So uh, obviously in the Air Force, and uh, we were able to get funding to build what we call the Valor Program, which you saw earlier, the virtual advancement for, and learning for operational readiness, it was to deliver that content to multiple trainees who are geographically dispersed. And so it kind of listed here goals of es establishing essentially a, you know, the, a metaverse to kind of uh, pull in team training um, to build not only individual skill, but also in team uh, mechanics, right, and communication, really powerful in the virtual space especially over distance, which um, the other panel members have already alluded to. One of the things that's really phenomenal in this space is being able to capture lessons learned, right? So if we look over the last 20 years of combat operations, we've learned a lot of really painful lessons, right? We've learned how to take care of people better and save lives. And so as we look at a drawdown in major combat operations, there is definitely a threat of losing some of those lessons. So if we're able to capture that and translate that into experiences that people can kind of dust off, right? We pull off and put a headset on, it's, it's very, very powerful versus just reading an article or um, you know, kind of pulling out a read file. So capturing all of this expertise. Um, and really TTP, we, we, the military, we have a lot, of, a lot of acronyms, but tactics, techniques, and procedures is not only we can practice these things, but we can actually develop new ways of doing things in the synthetic environment. Um, and then validate that in, in ways that doesn't cost time, money, and, and lives potentially in high-risk training scenarios. Um, but yeah, running the gambit from something as mundane as small unit care or taking care of the sniffles um, to things as complex as taking care of multiple patients blown up to include canines too, um, very powerful to be able to create in a synthetic environment anything that you may encounter um, in ways that you wouldn't even you know, necessarily be able to do um, in physical simulation. Right. So I'm happy to be here, thank you for the opportunity. Right. And uh, last but not at all least. Hi guys, I'm William Belk. I'm the Director of Simulation and Innovation for Air Methods Corporation. Uh, and we are a large air medical provider here in the United States with a little over 160 helicopter bases and six simulation centers across the country. Uh, so we've been using virtual reality for about three years now. There was a, a year or two of development leading up to that. Uh, and much for the same reasons these guys have talked about already, we needed something that we could use remotely at our locations as well as on site when we're in our, our actual simulation centers. Uh, and so everything from jumping in and doing critical care, something like ventilator management or running a, ma a machine where we have a digital twin where you can plug the buttons in, you can take all its settings. We need to be able to do that in VR. Uh, but we also need to pay attention to that skills decay as John already referenced of saying, hey, if someone goes two or three years between training on a specific subject, that skill set starts to fall off after a few months uh, and continues to fall off until they hit that two-year recertification and then they get bumped back up and then they start to fall off again. And so what we were doing is targeting those areas of high-level skill decay, figuring out what we could do to, to kind of get ahead of that, if you will. We've been using virtual reality for that. Uh, currently, we have, I think, 13 custom cases that we've built with our partnership with Simex. Uh, and that's everything from you know, in-hospital transfers to one of ours is an outdoor climbing accident, so trauma to medical, everything across the, the field there. 
Uh, and you know, we've been able to recreate all of our equipment in real size and functionality inside of virtual reality for our crews to be able to use it. So appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Fantastic. All right. Well, like any good moderator, I have planted a bunch of questions. But maybe before I, I try those planted questions, if there's anything that this group wants to ask the panelists off the bat, please. Yeah, so we, we worked with, that? oh, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you mentioned um, you built 13 different scenarios with Simex. So if you can just describe some of the, the scenarios and kind of what parts of the scenarios lend themselves really well to a virtual environment that you can't really do um, with physical mannequins, let's say, high-fidelity mannequins. Absolutely. So, yeah, so my background is in high-fidelity simulation using mannequins. Uh, and so virtual reality is, is kind of supplementing that as we move forward. But to give you a, one of the first cases that we created with Simex uh, was a climbing accident, which I kind of talked about a minute ago. But in this climbing accident scene, and Karthik, I don't know if we have pictures of it or not, uh, it is the entire environment is there, right? You're standing at the base of the cliff. Your bystanders are non-player characters. They're there that you're able to interact with. You're able to talk to them. The pilot from the helicopter obviously is not a crew member as far as taking care of the patient, but you can send him back to the helicopter to pick up equipment. Those are things that are hard to do in the sim center because no matter what I do in the simulation center, you're still in a very sterile room with a hard floor underneath you, right? We throw the mannequin on the floor. We can put them on the bed. We can drag them outside, uh, but you're not in that environment itself. Uh, the other thing that we can do in virtual reality that's a lot easier than is using a mannequin is interacting with that equipment, whereas the patient actually responds to maybe a ventilator change or some kind of treatment with the monitor. Yeah, we can do that sort of with the mannequin, but it's usually someone behind the computer pushing buttons and kind of changing vital signs, whereas in virtual reality, I can increase or decrease the rate of the chest rise and fall as you increase the rate of the ventilator. Uh, and so we can go in and get a little more specific with making the equipment interact with the patient versus saying, OK, and here's what you just saw, which is what happens a lot in high fidelity simulation is, hey, I need to check the vital signs. Well, the machine doesn't have vital signs, right? So I say, oh, OK, your new blood pressure is this. Or I change some numbers on a screen, and you look at the screen on the wall. In virtual reality, those things are tied to the equipment. And so as you're changing and making those settings, we get to see that stuff in real time. Thank you. I just want to add to that. Even in high fidelity simulation, right, you can, you can have, like, you know, take a blood pressure, and it comes up on the screen. And, but when I go in to see the patient, and I'm like, can you squeeze my hands for me? Well, I have to say, as the, as the facilitator, like the patient's strength is five out of five. It's not really, really realistic. And the fidelity then decreases as, and the engagement of the learner also decreases because they're not suspending this belief as if it's real, right? So in, in VR, I could actually put my hands there and I could feel the patient you know, gra grasp my hands. I could ask the patient to lift their leg. I can't do that in a high fidelity simulator. I can't assess lower extremity strength. I can't you know, have them put their hands to their nose or, or smile and make it symmetrical or stick out their tongue and do it midline. Those are the things that, in virtual reality, that you can definitely get to. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you mentioned you, you're supplementing the current training with the VR, um, could you elaborate a little bit if you're replacing, or like how much of the previous training are you replacing it with VR right now? Yeah, so I'll give you an example. I, every single year, every nurse and paramedic that works <laughs> for our program, which is close to 1,500 employees, is required to do an eight-hour day in simulation, eight-hour day in cadaver lab and vent training as well. Uh, of that eight hours, an hour and 15 minute minimum is spent in virtual reality. Uh, so basically, what's that, a sixth of the day, a seventh of the day that's spent in virtual reality. Uh, we're also using it in place of return to work simulation training. So if you have a nurse who, or, or a paramedic, right, that's been on maternity leave for three months, when they come back to the flight line, we require them to go back through a, a much shortened version of their orientation just to check that clinically they're back where they need to be. We do the same thing for extended military leave. You spent six, you know, six, 12, 18 months on deployment. You come back. We normally put you through kind of a condensed orientation. We run you through the sim lab. We just make sure that you're exactly where we need you to be. In virtual reality, it allows me to send that VR headset directly to that person's house or to the base that they work at. And now I'm not asking a brand new mom to spend two or three days away from her new child to fly back to the sim lab and spend a couple days going through training, right? We're able to do that at their house. Same thing for military leave. You just spent 18 months away from your family. The last thing I want to do is bring you back to the sim lab for three days and fly you halfway across the country. Uh, and so we're able to supplement our existing training. And in certain circumstances, usually return to work of an existing qualified clinician, we can replace some of our physical simulation as well. Does that answer your question? I also love to hear kind of you know 
on the nursing side, do, what do you think like, the future of VR replacing existing, existing training that's being done is in nursing? So I think there's an aspect of replacement that can happen uh, to get the students more readiness before they go into um, a clinical facility to take care of patients. Um, until, and I know we'll probably talk about this later with barriers, but until the, the haptic portion, and I know that's an expensive endeavor from what I've been hearing today, um, but until that's really there, there's certain skills that uh, I can't train my nurses to do in the VR world with handsets um, because they can't get the psychomotor skill down that they're really going to need to do that. Um, however, the idea that we can replace some clinical time with a VR simulation that puts them, once again, as we've been saying, in any environment. I can put them in emergency department or I may not even be able to send them. I can put them in an emergency pediatric situation where I've had students, even if they go and do five, six weeks of a pediatric rotation, they might see some RSV cases and that's it. They don't really um, have a lot of variety in the experience. We can have um, continuity, consistency. They'll all see the same thing, and we can then really measure their competence and what they're doing. So that's where I see a lot of the replacement value coming in is in measuring competence. There's a new set of essentials for baccalaureate nursing education that just came out last year, and it's very competency-focused, making sure that these students have a readiness for practice when they graduate from our programs. When I put them in VR, I can ensure that there's more consistency in the education that they receive so that in replacing, we can give them a more valuable experience. And I would say, you know, at University of Penn, they're very cautious, if you can imagine. And so everything needs to be research-based. And we have done some research, just like you had said, and the research is building. And it's building just like in-person in uh, mannequin-based simulation was, you know? And it's in favor of VR, that you're, we're reaching the same educational objectives and outcomes that we you know, can get in a simulation based as we can get, I mean, they're equal in VR. And so as that research is, is building to support it, we can see ourselves replacing it um, more frequently. But I would say right now, currently, we're using it as an adjunct. It's like, you know, if you, everyone wants more simulation, more simulation, they want more practice, like you said, on competency-based education. And so we're limited. We're limited by real estate. We're limited by money and all those things. VR expands that opportunity, and it gives our students the ability to repeat scenarios over and over again without that big cost overhead. Um, so I think, you know, I see it as an adjunct. I see it as, you know, extending simulation um, and making it more available. Yeah, I think I would add a lot of it is it changes what you can supplement based on the level of your trainee, right? I think mm -hmm. in the military, we look at kind of distinct phases. We have initial skills training, which we have kind of pretty good solutions for in the military. We generate a pretty good product in terms of capability. But where really, well, skill sustainment becomes the issue and really growth. A lot of times we talk about sustainment and that's really kind of a limited kind of view. We should be striving to get better, right? And the only way to do that is to see more clinical patients, right? At the end of the day, I'm an mm -hmm. emergency physician. I spent the last part of my uh, time in the military really doing admin stuff, right? Kind of fighting for resources and making sure the guys you know, below me were trained right and had the equipment they needed to save lives on the battlefield. But I worked weekends and holidays to maintain my skills as a clinician, right? So you can kind of, especially as a skilled you know, individual, you kind of know when you're starting to get soft, right? Like I kind of know when I need to go work out some, and also when I need to get in the hospital and see patients. Um, for those who have not necessarily had that same level of exposure, they don't necessarily have that kind of internal vector check. Um, and so you guys, it depends, right? The answer is always based on the learner, kind of what you need. We tend to see in the military that people are very much mechanically inclined, because that's kind of what they, you know, especially in the listed force in terms of soft medics in particular, they're capable of doing chest tubes. They can do innovations. It's really like, okay, when do I do it? When don't I do it? And if I do it and I don't get the desired outcome, how do I troubleshoot it, right? That's clinical expertise. It's really what we're talking about is how do I accelerate expertise, you know, developing expertise. And I think through all of my years of training, it's not very efficient, right? Traditional medical training is inefficient. A lot of it's just man, free manpower, right? To, to, to keep the system afloat, which is valuable too. Um, but not every day that I went to the ER was va you know, value added. I didn't always leave there going, wow, I really learned something cosmic today, right? So if I start off knowing, hey, I need to see these 300 patients, 
and until I get it right, you know, fail fast, fail often. And that's, you can do that in virtual space and, ch and mm -hmm. cheaply, right? I don't burn supplies. I don't, I really mm -hmm. burn limited time. And if I can do it without a lot of like, moderator oversight I can I can do it like with feedback internal or at least take some of the lift off you know our instructors then you can you can do some amazing things and learn really fast almost scary fast so in the military it's all about how can I take somebody from zero to hero as fast as possible because that's what the mission may dictate especially in the future so that's the power of the system you still need to supplement part task trainers both of you guys touched on this Beth and John uh, that it's not about the physical skill or the capability of the clinician, right? I, I'm lucky enough that I've got 1,500 flight nurses and flight paramedics. These are extremely talented, extremely intelligent people, right? Or they wouldn't be in the positions they're in already. I'm not necessarily worried about their ability to start an IV or to intubate a patient. I'm more worried about their critical thinking and watching them make that decision of, hey, when do I actually pull the trigger on a surgical airway or putting a chest tube or doing an escherotomy? Uh, as well as saying, okay, well, now that I know how to do it, do they understand the correct steps? Can they follow the procedure? Because that we can still do in virtual reality, right? They may not be holding a syringe, or sorry, a syringe, or they may not be holding a scalpel and doing finite motor movement, but I'm still watching them clean the site, make the incision first, prep their equipment, have everything ready to go. We get to see their decision making, we get to see their thought process, even when we don't necessarily see them grab the scalpel and take it to the patient. Great discussion, please. Thank you. Um, it's kind of interesting just to hear the kind of, uh, I guess, between uh, procedure versus motor skill kind of training. And uh, there was one comment about how haptics were important for the transfer of motor skills to um, people who are practicing specific type of whatever procedures that require that training. Yet, it seems what you're saying is largely that the motor skills are very much secondary to the process. Um, and so I'd be curious what the percentage kind of breakdown that you would say uh, you, the person who was discussing haptics, sorry, I, I can't remember what your name was, yeah. why you think that's important versus just the procedural side of things? Well, so, so once again, it's the level of the learner. Um, so I work primarily with undergraduate baccalaureate nursing students. They have maybe not even ever touched a patient before. They pick up a Foley catheter, they have no clue how to do sterile technique or what to do with it or how they're going to hold it in their hand when they're with a real patient. Practicing physicians and nurses who have done this, they could probably start an IV with their eyes closed because they have that psychomotor skill down. It's a different level then of really looking at the problem solving, the critical thinking, what are you going to do when something goes wrong, where I'm starting with them at a basic level of Let's see what you can do with this skill first, and then we'll move on to now. How are you going to know that something's wrong? How are you going to problem solve it? But they're not at that level yet. So I would say there's a higher percentage, I don't know that I could put a number to it, um, of need of having that psychomotor side. Because once they get past that, then they can start thinking more about what they're seeing. My first semester nursing students would be overwhelmed with anything beyond that. I think speaking as a technologist, one of the biggest challenges in, in, for us in haptics is that, you know, the, the haptics isn't like a yes or a no, as everyone in this room I, I'm sure knows very well, it's, it's a continuum. And so haptics are anything from like a controller vibrating to, you know, in theory, something that's really mimicking a surgical incision with really exactly the right feedback that you would get. And um, different parts of this, that spectrum is important for different types of learners, as, as our panel is saying, you know, I, I think for a, a raw medical student, you really don't want to teach them the wrong thing because if you have poor second order transfer in somebody who has no real experience or very limited real experience, they're going to do it wrong the first time. Yeah. Um, the same through, it's not a VR specific problem. Even, you know, when I was a medical student, we trained on part task trainers, these models that we were trained to do, say, a lumbar puncture a procedure where you puncture the, the uh, spinal cord. It doesn't feel like it does in a real person, yeah. but it feels a lot closer than we can get with haptics. But even so, people struggle in the first real patient because it doesn't feel right. And so one of the things we've really struggled with on haptics is where, how do we tune that to a point where people aren't going to have negative skills transfer? And that either means only doing it with people who are really experienced or getting it just right. And right now, I think there's not really any way to get it just right enough for mm -hmm. one of those very early learners. But you know, as a result, nobody really knows what that world might look like if we could. It'd be really cool to find out. 
but you know, we, I, I too work with like I, undergrad nurses and then graduate nurses, and you know, definitely different use cases. But for the undergrad nurses, you can definitely, and I'm sure Beth would agree, that you can use this for clinical judgment, and that's a huge piece of nursing, mm -hmm. and to hone in on their assessment skills. And to be able to determine like what's the, you know going on with this patient and and practice you know looking through a chart and calling a provider and identifying abnormalities things like that so there's a lot of use cases for an undergrad nurse that are not psychomotor focused mm -hmm. but um, but are definitely you know huge outcomes for us so um, and especially like in interprofessional education as they're starting to you know progress and trying to get different disciplines in in the in the um, cases as well is really challenging. Um, and VR is something that can overcome that as well. I would say too, depending on what you, what you do, what your discipline in medicine is. So as an emergency physician, I work at a pretty busy community ED with really very little specialty support, um, with a high, like, uh, with a lot of trauma, right? So, and maybe on a good day from my optic, right, a bad day from a patient perspective, how much time am I spent doing procedures? And it may be an hour out of 12, right? So I mean, just, it was kind of, you know, a little bit of, you know, spitballing, you know, less than 10% of my job is really procedural. So there's so much that we gain in, in just cognitive training that really, when we start to kind of get off the rails with haptics discussions, I mean, it's valuable, we have to continue to drive, but we don't give our bodies enough credit. I mean, to, to, you know, proprioception and tact, the, the, you know, sense of touch is incredibly complicated and we're a long way from something that's not clumsy and actually detracts mm -hmm. from training. And so anyone who's waiting for haptics before they actually dive into the space is gonna be waiting a long time and missing the opportunity to train the other 90, 95%, depending on your discipline, that matters. Agree. <clears throat> Please, thank you so much for the thorough response to his question. Just to build up on that, um, can you just elaborate how or, or where you see the cost savings? Because you, you mentioned that 90% um, of your, your job talking course is, is mostly um, cognitive and 10% is procedural. And I think uh, you know, Dr. Bath um, also mentioned something very similar. Um, so I'm just trying to wrap my head around mm -hmm. when you guys deploy these VR solutions, where does cost savings come from? Uh, because I feel like, or at least from my very limited medical knowledge, you know, let's say if you're trying to someone, train someone for CPR or something, that sort of uh, haptic feedback and, and the physical uh, materials and things are, are very, very important. So. so, you know, I can speak to that. I actually worked with a couple of faculty members from the University of Florida last year. I'm a family nurse practitioner faculty and also an economics um, faculty from their uh, public health department. And we looked at what would it cost to set up a simulation space with high fidelity mannequins where you're actually doing everything hands on, real supplies, equipment, they're going through everything versus setting up virtual reality with the exact same type. We just used a basic medical surgical um, type scenario. Um, and having someone from an economic side who could really help us understand what it looked like costing out, setting up the space, how much supplies would cost, having the real estate to do it in, um, then also having everything that goes along with upkeep of that space versus, yes, a little more possibly upfront with buying equipment, having, um, if you have to develop your simulation, if you have licensing fees for your headsets. When we costed it out over the first three years, though, there was about a 35% difference virtual reality was about 35% cheaper, and that wasn't taking into account what I've seen over the past two years in my simulation center, where most of our supplies have gone up at least 50% in what we're paying for them. I have a, another real world kind of mathematical example, and I'll, I'll give you kind of rough estimates, but I just purchased six high fidelity pediatric simulators, right, for my six training centers, and it was $750,000. Uh, my initial investment in virtual reality, which included licensing software, scenario development, and 24 headsets with cases and shipping material and everything, uh, as far as hard cases, not the scenario cases, uh, was $140,000.
So when you look at it that way, I have a piece of equipment that I, for 50 bucks I can overnight anywhere in the country and have it set up using any space that I have without having to pay a lease on a facility. Granted, I have to do that anyway for other reasons, um, but you know, side by side comparison, it's significantly less expensive, even though it is expensive up front, than trying to roll out a new piece of equipment across my entire company. So a lot of times you know, in virtual reality, I have adult, infant, I have pediatrics, I have you know, OB patients. And if I wanted to do all of that in physical mannequins, that's sixty dollars to $100,000 per mannequin. I need at least four of them to recreate those four patient categories. And, that's and they need to be replaced every nine years. It, well, yes, and they need to if be they maintenance make it nine years. and PM. Yeah. And you need an operations <laughs> team to run it. And then you need AV equipment to also run your, you know, to be integrated into your simulation center. You need people to be able to, to run that as well. So you're saving on all of that using mm -hmm. VR. There's also another phenomenon that I noticed in the military is we have really, we can do novel things using synthetic environment, VR, right? I can augment and, and create scenarios on the side of training to make it better, to make it more immersive, to do things I wouldn't be able to do. I've taken it overseas and trained foreign militaries and like essentially out of my backpack. And so there's, all, there's, a, there's a, a thing I kind of came up with, it's always more expensive to do something than nothing. And so a lot of times we're doing training that we never could do before. Yeah. In, in, in ways that's really unique, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's just some things we just never did before, so it didn't cost any money to not do it, right? It costs a little bit of money to do some really amazing things, you know, and really the sky's the limit as somebody who understands your particular population, right? Like, I know my group of PJs need this, right? And I, you know, and I can really take this technology and, and really do some cool things. And, and you mentioned CPR specifically when you were talking about it. Uh, there's actually another virtual reality healthcare company based out of Colorado that did a study a few years ago, and they were looking at ACLS. So ACLS is like CPR plus, right? It's where you get the more advanced procedures. Uh, they did a side-by-side -side comparison of physical ACLS training to virtual reality ACLS training, and VR was 83% cheaper. Like it was significant cost savings. Now that's one specific skill set or one specific topic, right? Um, but in that setting, and that, at the time that was the only thing they were creating, but at that setting it was a significant cost savings. Yeah. Jump up to the mic. I know we talked a little bit about the haptics, uh, and I'm curious about your take on using the virtual simulations along with the physical, like, uh, like mixed reality or augmented reality along with the high fidelity mannequins? Yeah. I, would, I would say that that is a superior approach to, to incorporating tactile feedback, right? Is the kind of the pass through MR type stuff. Augmented reality, I think, you know, again, there's no one thing right now that solves everything. Mm -hmm. And so you have to kind of layer it for maybe that 10% or procedural or if, you're a proceduralist, if it's 90% cool job, I'd like to have it. But ultimately, you have to just weave in the technology. But I think that's a much better option as it stands now than haptics, right? Just the gloves right. and all the systems that I've tried and seen some pretty cutting edge things. They're very bulky and really the stuff that you do, like even an escrotomy trainer is so like clunky that it's, you know, somebody has done escrotomy, like it just isn't helpful. So I think that's a better approach, is to use something that allows you to layer, layer and, and be able to use your equipment and your, sense of, your, your innate sense of touch. There's, there's no one solution to every problem, right? And that includes virtual reality. I think a lot of times if you're building a really robust VR slash XR program, you're gonna be looking at some mixed reality, some virtual reality. You're probably gonna have more than one vendor that you're working with because nobody creates the kind of end all be all you're gonna to go to say Simex for one thing specifically, we're looking at doing strict virtual reality, but you may go to another company to do the augmented reality pass through simulation as well. Uh, just at this point, there, there's so many different things that we need to try to get across that there's no one Band-Aid that I can slap on all those problems and fix it. I, I, I have one more question. <laughs> Let's, we'll, 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 we'll rotate through the group at least once. <laughs> Okay, so for me, I'm just going to add another layer to the question of effectiveness, because I would love to integrate uh, virtual reality to our simulation program. So for those who have done that business case, how have you presented that measurement at the same time aligning the, the business goals with the learning objectives uh, at the same time? So, so everything I do <laughs> for my students starts with objectives. <laughs> Um, 
faculty will come to me with, oh, I saw this really cool task trainer, or I saw this great device at a conference I went to, and my first question is, tell me what learning objectives it will meet. 90% um, of the time, I never hear from them again, <laughs> because they never thought about that. They just thought it was a cool piece of equipment. Um, the thing with VR was that we presented the objectives of having them in either, like I said, an emergency department scenario, having them all have the same scenario so that if we wanted everyone to experience a patient in sepsis, we could make sure everyone could experience that. So that when we're meeting the um, overall objectives of courses, we can look at things. These are really important. Students need to experience this, and VR allowed it to, us to do that. So that was really my starting point. And then also saying, and I won't ask you to build me another room. <laughs> Yeah, and that's, I mean, we have a pretty robust undergrad program, so, you know, we already run our students through two hours a week for every clinical course, which is pretty unusual in a lot of other places. And so I couldn't, like, go on that avenue because it's like, okay, we already do that. Where I, where I focused on is we are booked, um, and very similar to what she said, 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. And our students want more, and they deserve more because they deserve to have repetitive practice at their fingertips. Um, for the reasons that you all mentioned. And so this was like, okay, well, we want to produce really, you know, competent nurses that have the ability to come in here and practice on their own without having to be scheduled time and all that, then, then we can do that. And so we, we lined them up with some objectives. We also looked at some cost savings in our proposal. Um, and then we looked also at some of the money that's out there for grants, and that's how we got it funded initially. We focused things, you know, where 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 it was. Like we looked at opioids, and we started a little bit. That's how we actually started with all of our our grant funding. And we looked at doing uh, VR case uh, VR training for Narcan, um, and we got that started. And we did a little study. And we showed that it was effective, and the educational uh, retention, or, you know, the, the knowledge acquisition was the same in VR versus in person. And then it just grew from there. Thank you. Yeah. Hey guys, um, thanks for doing this, this is awesome. So you guys elaborated on the rare um, clearly here, right? So that we can do things which are otherwise rare very often. So typical success kind of in VR, we see that a lot. You talked about the expensive, so the cost, but what about the impossible, right? Like usually that's a component too. And I think in the military, when you have tactile training, there's a lot of that impossible so that you can repeat now what you have done in the physical world from all angles, from all kind of ways, you know, that the gun just like pointed in the wrong direction and you would have shot the person most likely or, or friendly fire kind of situation. So for you guys, where does it play a role to be able to repeat or like, like to, to look later what people were doing in these situations in, in that sense? So like, like, is there an impossible use case I'm asking basically? John? Impossible. So you're reacting, is there something that we just can't accomplish in virtual? In, no, uh, you can't accomplish in the, in the physical world, because in the oh. physical world, you do it <clears throat> once, and then maybe somebody observes it, but you can't necessarily fully replay it, let's say, right. for example, right? Okay. In VR, I can record every step you do, yes. and I can later say, hmm. Yeah, so we've done a lot in, in, with uh, developing mass casualty scenarios, which is hard to replicate without like, large-scale efforts, right? Mm -hmm. So full mission profiles. And what's also powerful in the virtual space is operational context, right? So I can, I can challenge an individual or team, which is even more powerful for a military use case or EMS or you know, first responders, is managing the scene, managing your team, and being able to effectively communicate to higher headquarters, whatever that may be, command and control type stuff, right? So that's a very dynamic environment. To recreate that, we still do them, large scale exercises in the military, of course, but it's, it's, you know, hundreds of people and millions, you know, a million or two dollar, you know, I mean, it's just super expensive. So, and what, what, what we see a lot of times is these complex um, exercises in the military, even though there's medical piece to it, it tends to get to the point where it's so complicated that the medicine that happens within it is really fairly rudimentary. And, and a lot of times we don't even <laughs> capture how it was done or performed, right? We're like, okay, we did stuff, you know, and was that effective? Probably not, right? Better yet, we can use this technology to practice, rehearse, and then you can execute more cleanly and more expertly a large-scale exercise, right? And, and so even within that space, I can prepare 
to do something complex and then do it in terms of a validation piece. But to your point, yeah, the power of the synthetic environment is to be able to record everything and, and to kind of timestamp it and to play it back and to do it repetitively, right? I think there's things that in my clinical practice I've never had to do for real, right? If I think about perimortem C-section, probably the most complicated thing because I'm going to have to now resuscitate two patients. And maybe in my, in my ER where no one's coming very quickly, I'm doing both, right? So I'm having to do something that's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. And now I've got two patients, right, if, it, if things go well, right? So those types of things are incredibly powerful in the, in the synthetic environment. So yeah, to your point, there's no end of the complexity that you can create. If you can envision it, you can kind of do it in a way that's realistic, right? We talked a little bit before about just avoiding training scars. That's a huge thing in the military, is what I don't want to do is, is to kind of simulate something that's not quite right. And now you like learn, you do that a hundred times and you're like, okay, I'm ready. And you're like, that doesn't translate, right? Negative transfer, that's a huge issue. Um, so there's a lot of work that we need to do is make sure we, you know, right time, right, you know, on time, on target, right, with this technology. You know, we really have people who oversee training need to very deliberately apply technology to not only a collective group, but an individual, right? Like, what do you need? And a lot of that's better, better tracking of performance and understanding gaps. What I like about it is I can take some of the cognitive load of, of, of executing training, and I can buy that bandwidth back to, to observe and to provide useful feedback, right? How many times do you run training for somebody, but then you're so smoked that you're just like, hey, good job, or hey, you know, maybe do a little bit better here next time. Like, we, we owe it to the, the learner to give better feedback, and the mm -hmm. system can help us. They can take off some of the load of executing training, and, to, and we can buy that back to give feedback that's useful and track it over time, which is even more powerful, right? So I don't know if that gets at what you're, yep. you know, I think the complexity and the operational context in, in my space, all of the other things that are going on at simultaneously, medicine tends, is not the mission typically. It's just what happens when, you know, the, your first plan doesn't survive first contact. And, and, cool. Thank and you. to your mass casualty reference, too, you asked about impossibilities. We're talking mass casualty event. There might be dozens of providers responding to 50 or 100 patients at one time. It is impossible, physically impossible, for us to capture every little conversation that goes on and be able to go back and debrief each one of those exchanges, right? If we're in a virtual world, sure, maybe we only have four or six people that are actually in that VR scenario, but we can record everything. And we can then play back and watch everything uh, to, a, to an extent that we couldn't possibly do in a real world scenario. There's no way that we're gonna be able to capture everything that was said and everything that was done when we're trying, even if we're following them around one-on-one, -on -one, it just doesn't work out that way. Every time you start talking, I have about 13 questions that pop up, so <laughs> I'll stick with one. Um, so in the late, in the 90s, there's basically this transformation in game engines and things like this that really facilitated the creation of content and took it away from really hardcore programmers and put it in the hands of designers and creative types, these like subject matter experts around what they wanted to build. So I'm curious to hear a little bit about the process that you go through as subject matter experts from nursing to you know, uh, um, emergency care in warfare, this type of stuff. What's that process like in terms of identifying what content you want to create and then actually getting it built and then testing and measuring the outcomes? I could talk a little bit about that. So um, it, you know, we took a case you know, and do a needs assessment just like you would in simulation um, you know, and try to figure out which case is going to be best suited for VR. Um, and then we worked with the, the software company where they give us a framework, just like a scenario template you would do if you were doing in-person simulation, creating all the scenes. Are these the kind of questions? You, is this what you're asking, how it's developed? Oh, totally. I guess I'm asking, are you happy? Are you content with the process? Or do you still find that there's not like a large barrier of entry? But I mean, if you keep going. Yeah, so it, the process is the same. I think in the beginning, what was the most challenge is where I come from, they want everything to be like the lumbar drain, the penway, the ventilator, the penway, and the software company was able to make it happen. So for us, the development is collaborating with them and saying, no, that doesn't look right. No, this doesn't look right. This is a picture of it. We want this, you know, mm -hmm. and or, you know, that's not how our ventilator works. And, you know, it doesn't look like this. And um, the tube here needs to go here. And so it is that, you know, it kind of a a conversation that goes back and forth with mm -hmm. a software company when you're in the development stage. Um, and then, you know, you could test it out and throughout the time you're testing it out and giving them feedback and you have an opportunity to actually make changes before it goes into production, correct? 
Um, and, um, and then, you know, you obviously run it. I think, you know, making changes once it's in production sometimes is a challenge. Um, and as things evolve, but, you know, the company Simex has, mm -hmm. has also evolved with that. Um, and so they've also made some changes on their end so that you can do that. And also run cases now, like, from the, from the start, from the build. Yeah. And that's one of the things when we were vetting companies to um, have our first scenarios uh, for use cases, our, that was our question. So in development, how many times can we look at something? What is your process before it's like, okay, here it is. You have to use it like this. No more changes. Um, how much input did we have into it? So as we filled out the template and then there was a whole discussion and question back and forth on that before even anything was built. What, what, what are your equipment needs in the room? What do you need in the space? How, what do you want it to look like? What do you want your patient to look like? Um, what, what kind of um, dialogue do you want? You know, going back and forth, and I unfortunately could give pages and pages of potential dialogue for, for, for a case. Um, they probably hated me the last one I said to them. <laughs> um, but you know, it's that process of then, okay, now we can try it in a pilot. And for my um, primary care case, for example, I had primary care nurses come in and go through the simulation with me and say, okay, is this what would happen in your office? And we made a couple more tweaks. Then it finally went into production. It was probably three months before it was in production with the back and forth. So I was very pleased with that process, but we were choosy in who we worked with to get, to get that. And I think the end user definitely is so important. Like putting someone, you know, like one of your, one of your learners in the case during when it's like in beta for you to give them to give you feedback as well. Because obviously you don't think of everything, just like when you're creating Sims from scratch. <laughs> I'll, I'll repeat it. What is it? So it's just with Simex. Uh, like, how do you commercialize? You, you pay to get this done as you can or whatever. And then how do you proliferate that silo of knowledge so that it's not just something for you? So the question was, um, how once you've invested in making this scenario, how do you proliferate it? How do you commercialize it so other people can benefit from what you've done? So they have something online where you, it's called uh, the marketplace. And so we can agree or not agree to put our cases in the marketplace. And you know, I think as a community, we've agreed yeah. that you know, this is super important because it's really expensive to create cases from scratch. And so if we could put them on the marketplace, and you can get a list of all the marketplace cases just by going online. Mm -hmm. um, and it's much cheaper, like you know, $200 a headset you know, versus you know, $20,000 to create a case. So I'm a medical educator as well, and I thought it would be helpful maybe for the developers or designers in the room if we could talk a little bit about how if you could combine AI with patient avatars, how that could replace standardized patients and the cost savings of that. And on top of that, talk about how putting that developing skins of interactive patients that can go over our mannequins so that we can interact with them might help and, and uh, allow us to do more with our patients. So, so uh, I'll, I'll take the first part. So the, the first question being how we could potentially do a lot of our communications type training, conversational, going back and forth, history taking, et cetera, uh, using AI generated characters. And this is actually being done. There are companies that are doing holographic mm -hmm. uh, AI characters that you can sit down across the table from. And of course, it's a big box, just like Ori was talking to us out of this morning. Uh, but you're talking to them, and you're able to go through and you know, ask their history, figure out what kind of medical conditions they have, talk about their family's medical history. Those are extremely important skills that have nothing to do with physical ability, right? And so that is, that is already happening. That is occurring. It's not something that we've found in virtual reality yet or that's being implemented. Uh, I do feel like there's a future for it, Karthik. I know you guys are kind of working through some of this stuff. Uh, where we could see the potential for an AI response from the patient itself in virtual reality. So Karthik, I don't know if you want to try and follow up on that. You know more than we do about you, what you guys have coming. Yeah, I, I can say that you know, we, we, we're certainly something we're interested in. We may have some announcements soon that I can't necessarily <laughs> announce quite yet. I will say though something that's really, because I, I, my background actually, my PhD background before I became a physician was in AI. Um, I was a scientist and um, something that I'm very cognizant of and the company's very cognizant of and I think community needs to be is that like AI, especially like new generative type AI, CPT type AIs can be very harmful. They can say things that are bizarre, they make things up, they create information that doesn't seem to be true and, and it's something that we're very concerned about. We, we don't, 
one of the things we want to really avoid is perpetuating stereotypes through simulation, right? When you, one of the values of VR simulation is that you can have almost any patient from any background provide an authentic representation of that background and their self so to help providers develop more competency. If I try to put a GPT model over somebody who's maybe not from a cultural context that the internet generally is comprised of, GPT is not going to do a good job of reconstructing um, at baseline how that person will interact with the clinician. And that, to me at least, is devastating. Right? I think it could really create a lot of training stars in a way that we don't really even think of them as training stars because we don't, that's not a problem that we necessarily encounter through that kind of simulation. It's a problem we encounter all the time in real practice where you have clinicians, unfortunately, who are used to one certain sort of type of thing and then don't understand a different thing that they encounter. Um, and so that's something we're really cognizant of. I think that's, there's a lot of benefits, there's a lot of risks. We want to make sure we, um, we do the right thing. With that, I think we are at the end of our panel. I want to thank you all very much for coming and for this really incredible discussion. Didn't use any of my questions, which I think is a win. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm sure some of us will be around afterwards if you have any further questions, but really appreciate um, all of you coming and thanks for listening. Great, thank you. Thank you.